1947, the government, faced with the task of finding homes and jobs for war-ravished London, designated this area the site of a new town. In spring, the Minister of Town and Country Planning, Lewis Silkin, set up the Harlow Development Corporation to build it. Frederick Gibbard was appointed to draw up a master plan to house a population of 60,000, eventually to rise to 80,000. He came to Harlow to explain his plan to the inhabitants. The plan received government approval. These years also saw the beginning of work on the heart of the town, the town centre. The commemoration stone was laid in May 1955, and Christmas that year was celebrated by the opening of the first shops. It was to be another 24 years before the master plan was completed, but the birth of the new town of Harlow had been accomplished. Opening ceremonies became commonplace. Two marked the unique role of sculpture in the town. The unveiling of the dolphin and boy at Vicarage Wood Paddling Pool by Sir Philip Hendy, director of the National Gallery, on June 4, 1954, and the unveiling by Sir Kenneth Clarke on May 19, 1956, of the sculpture which was to become synonymous with Harlow, Henry Moore's The Family Group. I moved here about 10 years ago, and the reason I moved here is because Harlow is such a well-planned town. Over, over my shoulder here, there's some quite dense um, housing, but it's well hidden by all the green spaces. And when Gibbard designed Harlow in the 1940s and 1950s, that was an intrinsic part of the design, bringing the countryside into the town, so that ordinary working people could have decent homes with good facilities, all close to hand within walking or cycling distance um, and still have access to the countryside. And it was a fantastic vision. And PDR is flying directly in the face of that planned vision. And I think it's wholly unacceptable that um, companies can convert office buildings into sometimes substandard accommodation without any recourse to planning requirements from the council and I also think it's wholly unacceptable that as a result of that London boroughs and other boroughs in the east of England can offload their housing problem particularly vulnerable ha families um, wholesale into one area in Harlow which doesn't have the um, facilities that the rest of Harlow has. At the Royal Town Planning Institute, we've been quite consistently clear on our position. And if we just take, for example, the democratic um, accountability issue, one of the things that communities tell us is um, they actually do passionately care about their communities. It's no great surprise. Um, so if you take away an opportunity to be involved in a process of place shaping, um, which is effectively what permitted development rights does, because it's just a prior consent, there is no opportunity to engage in the process for the community then then really you've sort of dislocated that community from what's going on in their local area so the democratic deficit if you like is evident in the fact that they're not involved and it's not just the community of course it's those elected councillors that would normally get involved in the planning process as well um, so there is no opportunity to engage the community in a consultation in a conversation about um, permitted development um, because a it's not required um, so why would a developer bother and um, doing it um, but but b um, there is no part of the process where they can be um, it's purely just you know prior consent in it goes and um, and, and and away they go We campaign as part of our research work and I suppose our biggest campaign to date is about permitted development and that's purely because it's 
it's the thing that's probably worried us more than anything else in the 30 years that I've been here. We really are shocked at what some developers are producing from former office buildings and shock that the government um, seems to think that's okay to bypass planning standards. It's, uh, there are only four matters which local authorities can um, have any say on and apart from that they re literally have to say yes to prior approval. What we're seeing is incredibly substandard housing as a result of bypassing the planning system. Literally tiny flats um, 13 square metres isn't unusual, that's the size of a typical double bedroom, only it's a flat. Um, and, and most recently we've seen whole flats without a window either, which I didn't ever think I would see. Usually a developer will be required to uh, meet certain space standards, um, provide amenity, areas for the local community and make a contribution towards infrastructure requirements for very large schemes that actually deliver the infrastructure but you know the sorts of contributions I'm talking about is um, you know, a contribution towards a number of school places or you know um, enhanced bus services or uh, GP places or um, a contribution towards um, that would be pulled across a wider area with other schemes and of course there is no requirement to make any of those contributions with permitted development rights and what that does um, is um, not only turns the community against um, the, the homes in the first place it sort of takes us a step back from where we want to be which is actually getting the community involved and this is not only at odds with the government's design ambitions but it's also at odds with the government's ambitions for neighbourhood planning um, and if you want to see more neighbourhood planning um, then you need to involve the community. Permitted development doesn't involve the community in the conversation. Very few of them have, a, have any outdoor space. I mean, offices don't come with balconies. Very few developers make any effort to add them. They often sit in car parks as well. I mean, you don't, you don't get places that are suitable to, to play around office blocks and there doesn't seem to be much attempt to, um, to landscape anything and provide any outdoor amenity space for the residents at all. Well, this is a, a, a small, a brick-built, ba very basic building in, in an industrial estate in Watford, and a uh, developer applied to convert it to 15 flats, um, six of which are wholly in the roof, which has no roof lights at all at the moment. The council tried to refuse their application for prior approval. Last December, the council said that the flats, as proposed, would not have adequate light or ventilation and concluded that their oppressive environment would have serious impact on the health of the future occupiers. Well, I think you've only got to look at the building to realise they weren't making it up. Sadly, the, uh, the developer uh, took it to review and the planning inspector overturned Watford's decision and said that they weren't grounds on which to refuse prior approval. If there's been a normal planning application, it would have been scrutinised by planners and, and the living conditions would have been tested against um, local planning standards and national planning standards and so on. And the uh, quality of the, the accommodation would, and, 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 the, and the location would all be scrutinised and a decision made. And I don't think there's any doubt at all that it would have been refused had it gone through the normal planning process. It's simply not suitable in anything like its present form to be housing. But of course, under permitted development rights, uh, the whole point of that is that you bypass the planning system for speed and efficiency and cheapness. Well, look, there are only three grounds on which we can refuse permitted development. Um, we can refuse it if there's a suggestion that um, the premises might be subject to flooding, if the premises might cause um, problems to the traffic infrastructure, the road infrastructure, or if the premises is adjacent to an industry which is creating harmful levels of noise. And none of our permitted developments um, suffer from those problems. So we can't refuse a permitted development. What we can do is we can define an area 
um, and then apply to the Ministry for what's called an Article 4 Directive. And an Article 4 Directive is special permission from the Ministry to refuse permitted developments. However, it's a long and very expensive um, process. Um, I'm slightly worried that the arbiters of whether we get um, this special permission to refuse permitted development are the same people that have introduced permitted development and have publicly said what a huge success it is. So I think they're unlikely to back down um, in all cases on that. I think it's perfectly clear that the government likes PDR because of the numbers. They're easy wins, the buildings are already there. If you take away the standards, they happen more quickly and you probably house more people because developers can cut them into smaller and smaller pieces. They must know it's not good enough, um, but the numbers are just too tempting. They're a significant part of the extra homes we've managed to uh, achieve in the last couple of years. There's been quite a lot of med media coverage recently which has exposed you know, examples like Terminus House. So they do know now, they do know how impoverished many of these conversions are and I'm really surprised and disappointed that they're pressing ahead. Well, you mentioned Terminus House. Terminus House is one of um, many permitted developments in Harlow. It's right in the town centre. Um, it has no play facilities associated with it, although there are children living there. Um, we have had reports from the police recently that three county lines drug gangs have been operating out of uh, Terminus House from the uh, residents that have moved there. We've had, uh, I think it's 14 drugs raids in the building. There's a lot of antisocial behaviour around the building um, as the residents spill out into the only available space around them, which is the town centre. Uh, residents have reported that um, they feel unsafe We've taken a considerable action with our community support officers to add extra um, patrols in the town centre to reassure residents. We've uh, lobbied the police who have increased their numbers in Harlow Town Centre to do the same. But really that's just treating the symptom. The cause of the problem is that Terminus House was never fit um, for a place of dense residency. There's no infrastructure there. And of course, it's a recipe for, it's a toxic recipe for disaster really, isn't it? If you move people who have been made homeless because they have um, addiction problems into a, a building where there are other people who have addiction problems, you're creating a market for drug dealing and then you put alongside that f very vulnerable families. It's, it's a toxic mix. I think you've been to Terminus House, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, I think... Two things that really strike you about this is, is one, the location. You know, it hovers above a bus station, a big bus station in Harlow. It's, it's an incredibly hard um, uh, environment. It's not, it's not again, any, anywhere you, where you'd want to live. And also the sheer scale of it. I mean, it sits above, it's nine, a nine-storey tower that sits above five floors of car parking. The way in, you go through bin stores and sort of, you know, ancillary space before you get to your home. And when you look at the floor plan, it's, it's incredibly institutional. It's just a central corridor. Most of them are windowless, the corridor. Um, might have a window at each end, but it's very long. And there are literally just um, very narrow, deep flats off each side of, of a corridor. It's, th there's nothing more you can say about it. And one of the other consequences of that is that um, half the residents will have a flat that faces north the other half will face south. I think it's north-south here. Um, but anyway, the point is they're all single aspect. They all only have one window, um, which means that staying cool in summer, if they're facing west or south, is going to be an enormous challenge. The ho you know, this, it's, it's the worst type of internal arrangement in terms of climate change mitigation. It really is. You get no through ventilation. All you can do is open your door to the corridor and I, I get the impression that no one would really want to do that in Terminus House and keep their door open unless they had to. Um, I've heard reports that it's very, very noisy in there. It shouldn't be because it should comply. You know, soundproofing is in building regulations. Space and daylight aren't. Soundproofing is, so 
something's gone wrong there, I think, but um, perhaps it's just the intensity of people. Basically, everything what you see here, that's all the living space we have plus the bathroom. Like, the kids are coming from school and basically all they can do is sit on their beds. They eat, drink, sleep on their beds. All you can do is walk in, you've got one bed to your left, take a few steps and then there's the next bed and this is where I sleep. And then you've got two steps and you've got your kitchen area. So, yeah, there's no privacy, not for neither one of the kids. Like, it's noise constantly, really. Like, all the time, yeah, there are people running up and down the balcony. They'll be, like, fighting on the landing. Um, you can hear everything, basically. Yeah. Like, it's a big brother. There's CCTV in the lifts on every floor. There's, like, you've got one right outside my door, then there's another one at the end. Then you get through the next floor, there'll be another one. Like, yeah, there's, I think there's 100 old cameras in here. If there's any fights, it often ends up being outside my door because I'm right by the lift. So I've had blood all over the wall just next to my like, door that I've had left on there two weeks and I thought, well, the cleaner's not doing it, so I had to wash it off myself because I was sick of looking at it. Since we got that door just there by the lift, you have to use, you're meant to use a fob to get into them two doors. Yeah. Um, when, they, when that's working, like that you have to use a fob, all night long, you'll hear the doors being forced open, which makes a loud bang, and of course, all through the night, wakes my kids up continuously. So I'm glad that the fob's not even working at the moment. <laughs> well, when, when, when the permit developments first came in, I believe it was after the last recession, um, there was obviously a lot of empty building blocks. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of them were just running with very small percentage of tenancies inside. Um, uh, also, with the recession, there was a lot of builders out of work. So there was a lot of situation: builders out of work, empty properties floating around, and there's actually a lot of uh, a lack of social housing from our side of uh, point of view. And with these buildings, it was a way of sort of redeveloping them, building, putting money back into them. Otherwise, I think they'd probably be knocked down and design, probably turned into designer flats. Um, so I think it was actually quite a good idea. It helps. And, it, you know, it gave builders back work. So it, it, to me, it's regenerated a lot of the buildings that were otherwise sort of running, you know, running into the ground. Of course, not having any of just having a prior consent um, does leave you open to not just poor quality um, but um, but you know an opportunity for things that perhaps wouldn't have been missed through a planning process to get missed now we're not saying that all permitted development homes are unsafe just to be clear we're not saying that but what we are saying is if you don't have a process then you're not going to be delivering the quality um, uh, safe homes that you could do if you were um, running that through a process and that's really important not just for design but for layout, amenity, you know there is no statutory consultation with all the statutory agencies that you would have usually with the police and the fire if you're just going for this prior consent so. Over the last few years, I mean I'm a Harlow boy myself, I've lived here for most of my life and over the last few years, I've seen it slowly empty, run down, the exterior was grey, the windows looked dated, and the whole, the whole area around it just started running down, uh, and then it, as it got quieter, then you started finding in the sort of lower ends of the car park, it's where people, you know, the youngsters would just hang around, probably taking drugs and drinking, and it, it, the whole place just got run down, and I think from our point of view, when we took it over, we've painted the front of the building, it's bright white again, We've put in brand new double glazing throughout the whole building. Um, and I, th I think we've turned it into a good, uh, it's a good use. We've put 222 flats in the building now. Um, there's a huge call for social housing in the whole of England now, I think. Um, so, you know, we could quite easily have built designer flats. Um, could have put balconies on them, we could have put hot tubs and made it all for private rented tenants who are accountants and doctors only. Um, most agencies locally, and again, probably throughout the country, I know Shelter are working with this, um, will tend to refuse anyone on benefits. 
and as a company we will you know we'll accept people and benefits all day long basically it all boils down to they're just lining their pockets basically they're a business that's what they're about I suppose everyone knows what the blocks are associated with now drug dealers and you know just <laughs> the wrong sort of people that you feel like you're being judged every time you walk through now. Well, I mean, we are finally waking up to the scale of the challenge of climate change, aren't we? And uh, even the government is planning a future home standard by 2025, I think it is, no more gas boilers and so on. And London has been you know, ahead of the game for some while, actually. They, they've called for zero carbon for a couple of years now. And it's tough, and, it, and it's particularly tough if you go down this, um, you know, highly efficient central corridor, single aspect route, which is undoubtedly good for numbers, but terribly bad in terms of climate. Um, ventilation is crucial in summer, and we need that to be natural ventilation, not, not our, you know, not aircon, obviously. It's it's just not tenable with, with climate change. So, and again, with PDR, um, the the premise is that you don't change the external envelope. Well, some of these buildings are many of them actually are, 50 years or so old, built in the 60s, 70s, 80s. We didn't do much. Um, we didn't know much about climate change in those days. We didn't insulate buildings very well. The cladding is quite flimsy often. Um, there are lots of windows in this particular building. Uh, they're not double glazed, I possibly. They wouldn't, certainly wouldn't have been in initially. So I think there are real concerns about the compromises we're accepting through the fact that this is existing fabric, which make them, should make them redundant now, given what we know about climate change. It's, it's madness.